So without further ado, Gareth, why don't you come and join me? Yeah, a little whoop for Gareth is allowed. I'll allow it. Gareth's going to speak to us from God's word. Uh, why don't I just pray for him as he, as he comes to do that? Yeah, Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you that we get to hear your voice in so many different ways, but that you've given us your word written down that we might engage with it and that it is living and active and helps us to change our lives and to know you, Lord Jesus. Would you bless Gareth as he shares it with us? Would you fill him with your spirit and give us open hearts to receive what it is that you have for us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This is our third week in our week of prayer. And today what I'm going to be doing is speaking about loving your neighbour. But just a couple more quick notices this evening. At 6pm we have our prayer and praise time where Michael, Nick, who's going to come up and do our reading in a moment, and Kat will be leading us in our time of prayer. And we're going to be praying for the outreach projects that we're involved with as a church, but also some of the wider stuff that we're involved with as well. So that is with Grove Night Shelter and with Food Banks. And just to quickly go back to Grove, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's involved. As a church, we served for 16 weeks. We're downstairs. We, every Thursday night, we opened our doors and we kind of housed 15 kind of rough sleepers, giving them a place to stay. And we did that for 16 weeks. And we worked with seven other churches who, throughout the week, they opened up their doors as well. And I just want to share a few stats um, so you can go away and kind of, well, just thank God for what he's done. So we housed 77 guests over the 16 weeks. 11 of these were women. Sadly, 29 other guests kind of didn't take part in the shelter program. They didn't turn up, even though they were offered a space. Um, there were two red cards handed out for bad behavior. But good news now, 18 homes were secured for people. Um, uh, one of these went to a Christian rehab center, and three of these moved into the new Grove housing project. So if you go to the Grove website, you can read about that. 11 others moved into further temporary accommodations. Three guests committed their lives to Christ. One got baptized at a church around the corner called Tower Hamlets Community Church. They ran theirs from a Saturday night to a Sunday morning and would invite the guests to come and stay with them at church. Another, family was re another man was reunited with his family back in Scotland, which is amazing. And, another, and we're given recommendations for another, family to, uh, another man sorry, to go to a church in Wembley where his new home is. So just a massive thank you to everyone who got involved. It's really good. Yeah. Um, thank you for everyone who cooked, for everyone who prayed, for everyone who slept overnight here, whoever made breakfast. Just a massive thank you. It's a huge team effort that we're all involved with. Um, so we are today, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 10, 25 to 37. And we're going to look at a story that a lot of us will be familiar with, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to invite Nick to come up and read that story to us. Um, but as we read this story and as I kind of dig a bit deeper into it, what I just want you to do is just think about maybe do you identify to, as someone from this story? And secondly, where is Jesus in this story and what can he do to help you today? And so Nick's going to come up and read. Thank you, Nick. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place he, and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring oil on oil and wine then he put then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day he took out two took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when i return i will re reimburse you for any extra expense you may have 
Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. A new social transformation pastor as well, by the way. So do kind of get to know him, get to ask what he's doing and find out all that's happening. So tonight I'll be doing the outreach um, service and yeah, come along and there's some new things which I'll be kind of restarting um, in the borough. So if you come along, you'll, you'll find out. I don't want to give it away because, you know, it'll ruin the surprise. There you go. You've got to come. So come. You better come. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so, so I'm going to go through this story in a little bit more detail and then just share a few things that I've kind of reflected on over the last couple of weeks. So what's happening? An expert in the law, in the Jewish law, has a question for Jesus. He's most probably a Pharisee, and he, he's someone who knew the law well, and he's someone who's able to go out and teach it. And he came to Jesus with a question, and it's an important question, isn't it? It's one we all need to be thinking about in many ways. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But sadly, the only reason he asked this question why was because he wanted to trap Jesus. This was not a friendly encounter. This man was trying his best to prove that Jesus was not who he said he was. Um, but surely, though, being this expert in the law, he would have realized that they've tried this plan before and it has not worked out. Because whenever anyone had previously tried to trap Jesus, it didn't go well. It happened in two occasions in Luke chapter 5. It happened again in Luke chapter 6. They kept on trying to do this and it didn't work. So straight away, he's digging a hole for himself. He's come to trap Jesus, but with one quick move, Jesus has now turned the tables on him. But because he loves him. And so what was he asking Jesus? He was saying, well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, the Pharisees, they've created over 600 rules to follow. They thought they could match God's standards by keeping these rules and following them. He wanted a rule or a set of rules so he could make his way to heaven himself. And so what does Jesus do? He responded to the man by asking two questions. He said, well, what is written in the law and how do you read it? first thing he did was to go back to the Bible. And we need to know that we can take people back to the Bible to find the answers that they have to their questions. See, the Word of God is simply not just a collection of words, but it's so much more. It's a life-changing book. It's a life-giving book. And Jesus takes him back to it. And so when people have questions, we can't be afraid not to go to the Bible with them. And then we've got to do what Jesus did. We've got to be willing to take them on a journey and go through the Bible with them, answering those questions that they're struggling with and then watching as their lives are transformed. But this man, like so many other, he knew the Old Testament and he knew it well because he would have recited it so often. And so he first responds to Jesus by quoting Deuteronomy 6.5. He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he goes on to quote in Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. But while this man, he knew these words and he could recite them and quote them, he didn't understand what they meant. And Jesus is trying to help him to understand them and to show him that, well, what he was aiming for was impossible. And so what does Jesus do? He responds to him by saying, well, you do this, you go out and do this, you go out and love God and you go out and love your neighbor and you will live. And what Jesus was saying, if you want to earn your way to heaven, you need to realize that, well, you need to be doing this all the time. There's no breaks in this. Every moment of your life, you need to be doing this in order to be saved. But he didn't take it on board. He wanted to justify himself, we're told. He wanted to show that he was righteous. And I uh, like would justify, I was kind of thinking what I could say. And I know a lot of people hate football, and so forgive me for using this. Um, but in football, if you live in London, what you find is that there is a lot of people that support teams in the north, like the Manchester Uniteds, the Manchester Cities, and the Liverpools. And then they try to justify themselves as to why they support these teams. Whereas in the south, in London, we're like, well, you're a glory hunter. They're like, no, I'm not a glory hunter. I've always supported this team. I hope that's the no one here. Um, he thinks he's right, though, this man, doesn't he? He thinks he's sorted on this first commandment, so he doesn't even ask... God to, uh, doesn't even ask Jesus about it. It's like, who is God? Who, why do I have to love God? I'm doing this. But then he does ask Jesus the second question. Well, who is my neighbor? And what this man was asking, he was saying, well, is there a limit to this love? He was attempting to limit this commandment. Why? To make it possible that he didn't have to love certain people. Because these leaders had redefined what it meant to love your neighbor. 
The religious leaders had changed that command from Leviticus to love your neighbor, and that included foreigners and those outside. It included everyone. And they began to create rules, didn't they, which allowed them not to love people who they didn't think were good enough, like the Gentiles or Samaritans who didn't follow their rules. And so he gives a challenge to Jesus. And Jesus takes up this challenge and he responds to him by sharing a parable. A parable about a man, most probably a Jew, and he's travelling from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho, an 18 mile downhill journey known as the Red or the Bloody Path. This journey was dangerous, this road was unsafe, and this man listening and anyone else listening would have known that he was taking his life into his own hands by going along this road. Because along this road were caves, and inside the caves were robbers and thieves. And they were waiting for people to pass by so they could jump out, attack them, and rob them. And maybe you're thinking, well, he shouldn't have gone down that road. He's a bit stupid, wasn't he? But sometimes, don't we all go down roads we shouldn't go down, or paths we shouldn't be on? I've done that many a time. When I was at school, there was a road we knew that if we went down, there was a possibility you could get bugged or robbed. And for some reason, one day I decided to go down that road. And I thought, who's going to attack me? Why? Who's going to stop me? You know, my backpack was the size of a suitcase. I don't know what was going to happen. And the moment, though, I decided to head down this road, I was surrounded by a gang. And sure enough, I was robbed of my bus pass. And they left me and just walked off. And no one stopped to help me. (laughs) Sad. And that's exactly what happened to this man, didn't he? He gets surrounded by robbers and this brutal attack takes place where he's beaten, he's robbed, he's left on the side of the road and he's half dead. And the robbers, they just leave him, unconcerned about what they've done and they probably move on to their next victim. But suddenly there is hope in this story. A priest walks past. The prospect of help and who better to help him but a priest. Surely this man who's just finished working in the temple will stop to help this man. But we're told that when the priest saw him, he passed by to the other side. He went as far away from him as possible. And we don't know the reason why. We're not told. We can speculate. Maybe he just wanted to get home. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he didn't want to touch someone who he thought may have been dying. Maybe he was scared of the robbers himself. But what we do know is that he saw him. He saw the pain he was in. And he moved as far away as possible from him and continued his journey. However, once again, there's hope in this story again, isn't there? A Levite walks past. Surely he will stop to help this man. He's just come from the temple as well, where he was serving, probably. And it says in some translations, though, he went to this man, he saw him. He went a little bit closer than the priest. But he did the same thing, didn't he? He saw him, he crossed to the other side of the road, went as far away from him as possible, and carried on his journey. This man needed help. And when Jesus said the word but, that man listening to this story may have thought, well, well, I'm going to be this next character in this story. Who better hero this story needed? But no, it wasn't him. It was a Samaritan who arrived, an outsider. And this would have been a huge shock to everyone listening. See, there was tremendous hostility between Samaritans and Jews. They were a hated group. And it started in the Old Testament when the nation split, of Israel split. It split to a northern and a southern kingdom into Judah and Israel. And Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south. And the people of Israel began to turn away from God and they began to accept other gods. And they began to marry other people. And the Jew, well, those in Judah began to hate them. They were taken over eventually by the Assyrians and they became known as Samaritans. And when they did all go back to begin to build a temple, the Samaritans tried to stop them from doing this. And they just became this hated group. They were seen as half-breeds, invisible in the eyes of Jews. And so if as a Jew, if you wanted to offend someone, you would call them a Samaritan. In John chapter 8, Jesus was called a Samaritan by someone. So having a Samaritan take center stage in this story would have been this huge surprise. And what followed would have been an even bigger surprise. See, what, when this Samaritan came to the man, what did he do? He saw him, he stopped, he didn't try to dodge him, he didn't try to get as far away as possible from him. He tried to help him. It says in the Amplified Version of the Bible, he was deeply moved with compassion for him. When he saw him, he had this desire in his heart to do something, to do something good for someone who was most probably hated by him. He went straight to where he was lying, didn't he? He didn't hesitate. 
Not only does he stop, but he's incredibly generous as well with his time and his possessions. He cleans the man's wounds with oil and wine, expensive items that he chooses to give away freely. He bandaged his wounds and he carried him on his own donkey while he walked alongside him. He took him to an inn where he continued to care for him throughout the night. And in the morning, he gave the innkeeper the money and told him, look after him. I will be back and I promise to repay any further costs. You know, this man was traveling on his own journey, but he was willing to deviate it from it to help this person who he didn't know, who probably hated him. And it feels in many ways when I read this that he's done this before because everything came so naturally to him. He knew exactly what to do. He had everything he needed to take care of this man. He knew where to take him as well. And it seems like he was expecting to meet someone on this road or he was actually looking out to help someone. And it was at this moment, though, that the story ends, doesn't it? And then Jesus asked the question to this man, well, which one of these proved to be a neighbor to the man who encountered the robbers? A simple question to which the man said, well, to the one who showed compassion and mercy. But if this was an exam question, he would have only got half a mark. No, I missed out the word Samaritan. And here is where we see his heart of this man who came to Jesus, that he didn't love his neighbor. Why? Because he couldn't bring himself to say that word, Samaritan. All he could say is the one who showed mercy. He couldn't accept the fact that a Samaritan was the hero of this story and it was this man's neighbor. And so Jesus responds to him, doesn't he? He says, well, you go out and you do likewise. Go out and show this type of love. Go out and love not just your neighbor, but your enemies. And what was his response? It was silence. We don't hear from him now. But silence is good at times because it means we have to go away and reflect on things, don't it? We have to think about what we hear. And I think it's important that we, as we read the Bible, we do take time to be quiet, to reflect and to listen and to think about what is being said here and what it means to us. But we don't know what this man did, do we? But I hope he did take some time out to reflect on what Jesus had taught him. And I hope he did respond to Jesus. Because what Jesus is saying is it's difficult teaching that we all need to reflect on. It's telling us what we need to be doing, how we need to be loving our neighbor. And Jesus is saying here is that to truly love your neighbor, it means that you go out to help someone who you have nothing in common with. That your neighbor is whoever is closest to you on that journey you are on. That you need to be willing to stop to help them. You know, to love your neighbor means that you go as far as loving those who are your enemies. Helping those who despise you or who you may despise yourself. It means helping those who you deliberately avoid in life. It means helping those who, when you see them and you want to move as far away from possible with them, you're saying, I'm going to step in and help them. It's not just about helping those who we deem worthy of our love. You know, loving your neighbor requires us to be filled with a compassion that is so deep that will lead us to move towards someone. It means to be willing to stop what we are doing, to stop where we are going in life, to help them regardless of who they are. All three of these men saw this man lying on the road, didn't they? But only one, one responded. Only one was filled with that compassion to do something, to go out and stop. And it's the exact same compassion we see throughout the Gospels. And who's there every time? Jesus. He is the one who has this compassion. We're told it 12 times in the gospel that Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion, and he went to them every single time. So when you hear this story, how do you respond? When you hear what it truly means to love your neighbor, what do you think? You know, as I reflected on this, I realized that too often I act and I behave like the first two people who passed that man by. You know, when I see people, I can sometimes want to move as far away from as possible from them, just to continue my journey. Or worse still, I know that I have behaved like those robbers. I haven't physically attacked anyone, because I know there's a camera watching. <laughs> um, uh, but I have, with my words, I have done stuff, and I have caused damage, and I've hurt people. And I know that if I want to be someone who truly loves my neighbor, I have to acknowledge that my own strength, I just cannot do it. I need help, and this is what Jesus is trying to show this man that he cannot do it. But if he really wants to love God, then he needs to truly love his neighbor. 
and I know and I understand that the love that is being described is this selfless, sacrificial love, but it only comes from God, and it is only made possible through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. See, this man had the answer to his problem standing right in front of him. He knew he couldn't love like this, and Jesus is trying to show him that. And he's doing the same to us today. He's trying to show us, actually, let me help you with this. And so as I reflect on this, the more and more it's like, actually, I need help. And the only person who can help me is Jesus. Because we need Jesus' compassion, don't we? Because this compassion allows us to see people differently, even those we don't like. This compassion draws us to people. It makes us stop on the journeys we're on to step aside and help them, whatever the cost may be. It means we'll journey with them and help them on that journey. And there's a story I think we've shared here before, so forgive me if you've heard it before. But it's a lady, and she's a Dutch Christian, and she hid Jews in the Second World War. And she and her family were arrested and taken to one of the worst concentration camps in Germany. And it was at this camp that her father and her sister both died. She survived the war. And she began to go around different churches speaking about God's forgiveness and his love. One day, one of the guards came into her church where she was speaking. And she immediately saw him. She remembered all that he did. And all she had inside of her was hatred towards this man. Which is fair enough in many ways. And he heard the message and he came to the front and he said, I just need forgiveness. I'm broken, I'm a mess. Will you forgive me? Will God forgive me? And she looked at him and she remembered the pain and the suffering he caused and he said she could only hate him. But then she prayed. And she prayed this prayer, Father, thank you that through Jesus you have brought into my heart God's love. Thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred. And she said at that moment, she just felt free. And she stretched out her hand and she said, brother, give me your hand. And when she touched him, she just felt God's love flow through her into his love. And she says, you'll never touch the ocean of God's love until you learn to live, forgive, and love your enemies. Now we are called to show this love to the world, aren't we? Because when we do, what does it do? It heals the most beaten, broken, and battered people in our society. It touches those who are lying on the side of the road dying. This love brings life, something that the world can never offer. But this love is only made possible through Jesus. And so we need to be asking for it. We need to be sitting down and going through this gospel and just seeing what he did. Let him teach us. Let him take us on a journey to show us how to do it as we step out in our day-to-day lives on our journeys to see where he wants us to stop and who he wants us to go to. But I've also taken from this story as well that at times I've also felt like that person who's been robbed, who's been left on the side of the road, who's been beaten, who's been broken, is just at times just laying there thinking, well, is anybody going to stop to help me? You know, you know, as a result, I've ended up with wounds. You know, when I was robbed that day, I ended up with this hatred for certain groups of people who have done this to me. It's like, God, I don't want them forgiven. I don't want them to be saved. You know, the good thing about that story, though, is someone did recover my bus pass for me so I didn't get home again. But from this story as well, I've learned that there is healing to be found. But the only one who can bring true healing into our lives again is Jesus. And part of me thinks that this man, he's standing there and he's in a lot of pain himself. He needs healing, doesn't he? You know, he's been hurt by what's happened from the Samaritans, by what's happened in the past. And he's struggling to love people in the way that Jesus wants them to because of that hurt. And what we need to know is that if we are hurt and if we are in pain, well, we need to know exactly, Jesus knows exactly where you are. He knows the pain you are in and he's willing to come right there to help you. No matter how messy it may be, he knows exactly what to do to help you. But again, we've just got to ask him to do that, to come in and heal that brokenness in our lives, that pain, so we can be free to love others. But healing can take time as well. This journey he took time for this man, didn't he? It didn't happen overnight. And healing can take time in all of our lives. But what God has started, he will finish. He will finish. And finally though, and this is what this story is all about. The story is about needing a saviour. You know, Jesus was trying to show this man, you need a saviour. You cannot do that. And that saviour was standing right in front of him. You know, he was in a corner. 
what was he going to do? And we're left wondering, isn't it, in the silence, is well, what happened? Did he humble himself? Did he acknowledge that he needed a savior? Did he acknowledge that he needed Jesus? Or did he just carry on his journey? It's funny, the next line in verse 38, it says, Jesus and his disciples continued on their journey. And I was just wondering, was he there? Was he with them? But that same question is for all of us. You know, are we needing a savior? Are we willing to lay down our lives to follow Jesus, to lay down what we think is right and put our trust in him? But once again, he's standing right there, knocking on that door, saying, well, let me come in and let me show you. I'm going to invite the band up. I just want to encourage you to go away and, you know, if it's not this story, find the story in the Bog Gospels. Sit down, reflect on it. What is Jesus saying? Spend time getting to know it. From this story, from me, what I've learned is that actually I need help in loving my neighbor. But that help comes from Jesus. I realize that part of me, the reason I can't love others is because actually I'm hurting. And I need him to help me with that as well. But he's there again right in front of us saying, Lord, let me help you with that. So I'm going to pray and then hand over to Kat. And then we'll have have communion. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have. It's way beyond anything we can ever imagine. But God, you call us to love our neighbors. And we just ask today that you will fill us with your love in our lives. You'll heal those broken parts in our lives, God. And on our journeys, we want to see those around us, God. We want to stop. We want to go towards people. That's only possible through you. So would you speak to us this week, God, about what it truly means to love your name? Will you show us and help us and teach us and lead us into that more and more? So as we reflect on your word throughout the week, God, we open our hearts to hear from you. And will you bless us in your name?